My name is Christoph Sauerwein. I am uh, one of the director of ICAD, primarily in charge of academic concerns. I don't know why, but that's the way it is. Um, um, so uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to, to introduce today um, someone I really admire um, because she's doing all that what I don't know to do. I'm a therapist. Um, and it's it's uh, Mark Jacks. And um, I think we had a lot of discussion at ICAD about how to address the coaching. In, in we didn't have any doubt about having uh, having Mark around. Um, we wanted really to bring some. That was sold immediately. <laughs> what we really wanted, guys, my friends, is to address something that is unclear. That is great. The, the recovery coaching is, for the time being, something that is evolving and has to be structured. It's a fantastic needed bridge between treatment, that's me, and afterlife, no, life after, sorry, that's you. Um, and so this is what we're trying to explore um, on, your, on your end bit. And I think it is central. My experience as clinician is that um, everything starts after, as in it's, it's, it's re-engaging with life skill, how to, to uh, make different decisions, how to, to reset the belief system, how to do that in a life-compatible way, not in a kind of over-therapized way. And I'm, I'm, I speak from my position. I have a tendency to overcomplicate a problem as a therapist. And I think the deal here is to simplify life, right? To have a better engagement with life. So we share sim similar values in terms of what is attachment, what is love, what is not love, um, what love may be. Because at some point, life is about being attached. It's about being with other people, partners, friends, and this is, I think, where, where the gap can be filled in. And, um, and when someone leaves my room, I'm happy to know that there's someone like Mark just taking it from there. And speaking of taking it from there, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a very, very good afternoon to you, and a very warm welcome to an unusually warm British I want to say summer, but it may be summer, so I won't, be, won't tempt fate. Um, I got up this morning and I was so relaxed and I arrived to find an audience with people in this room who have shared recovery with me, people who have therapised me, and I feel like Gandalf because I hardly fit in the room, as you can probably see. So it's kind of time to simmer down and welcome you all back from lunch. And I'd like to invite you to start with to do exactly that. I'd invite you to literally simmer down with me. So what I'm going to do, of course, the usual, whoops, the usual disclaimer, I just, I have to state that I haven't been paid for anything I'm going to refer to, etc, etc, that I can attest to. So I'm going to invite you just for literally a couple of minutes to close your eyes, to literally get settled, because we've come back from lunch and you've probably eaten something, you may have come straight from the street, etc, etc. So you don't have to close your eyes, but I invite you to. I, as I say to my clients, I'm not going to leave my chair. You may feel people brushing past you, but that's, that's fine too. So just for a minute or two, I invite you to literally become more aware of your breath. It's something we take for granted. It's something we ignore. It gives us life. We do it autonomously, but once in a while it's nice to just sit still. You can say to yourself, right now there is nowhere else you need to be. There is nobody else you need to be. Try to feel into your diaphragm literally rising and falling. Let that lunch digest a little further. There are three centers of intelligence in human beings that I believe in. The head, the heart and the body. We spend a lot of time in the first. So I invite you to drop into the rest of you. Your hearts, your bodies, and let them all become one. The word on my mind is presence. Let's see if we can find a little presence and switch off for the next hour and a half. Take a couple more breaths, and then in your own time, come back into the room.
Welcome. Welcome to you all. Presence, it's a strange concept to some people. What does it mean to some of you? I like talking to people, so don't be shy. What, is it, what does it mean to you? What does presence mean to you? Someone's definition of presence. The here and now. The here and now. Beautiful. Sir? So. Awareness of the, your surroundings. Awareness of your surroundings. Beautiful. I can completely concur. Presence to me, what does it mean to me? I've spent a lot of my life not in presence. It's taken me, I was 50 last year, and it, it finally caught up with me after 50 years. I'd spent a very large percentage of my life totally not in presence. To me today, when I get present, I, I do, I, I love that. I, I feel more aware. I literally see things more clearly. I can walk into a park and I, it's almost as if I have stereophonic headphones on. Things seem that much more clear, that much more real. So part of what I do, a major part of what I do, is helping people get present. Unfortunately, a lot of what we end up doing is that. We end up struggling. We end up buried in ourselves, in our work, in our relationships, and we end up stressed. I spent a lot of years very angry. I didn't know why, and I will explore that with you today. But presence finally has actually has a meaning in my life. What do we do when we struggle with the presence? Well, we're all at an addiction conference. So there are many, many ways people try to deal with, with a lack of presence. What happens when we don't have presence is we get uncomfortable. We, we feel something rising inside ourselves. I'm sure some of you can relate to that sort of somatic upsurge that you experience when you know something's wrong and it gets uncomfortable. So you need to do something about it. Now, there may be addicts in the room. I'm an addict in recovery, very often about it. There may be others. These may be some of the things that have blighted your lives. Just a couple of things to sort of emphasize why I'm so passionate about this. I'm going to throw an American statistic at you. It's very closely related to, to our country. This actually is mainly because my girlfriend is sitting at the back filming me. She's actually been working in prisons in California, doing some incredible work with inmates. So this actually just really hits me. The US comprises 5% of the global population. But 25% of the people incarcerated on planet Earth are in America. Crazy statistic. Of that, if you actually work out what people are in prison for, 85% of people in prison in America are in prison because of something either directly or indirectly related to addiction. That's huge. We, we all face massive challenges. Look at some of the recent articles that have been in the newspapers. You may have seen these. The top one is about a, 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 someone dying in a centre in America. The other ones refer to the plight of addicts being exploited by the press. I don't know whether you knew that bottom one. Google is pulling addiction treatment centre center ads worldwide. So we are up against it because people have been exploited. I draw this to your attention just because I want to set the scene for the fact that we have huge problems and you're all here facing them on the front line. My talk today is going to focus on, first of all, for a little while, who am I? Because if you don't know who I am, you won't see why I do what I do. And then that's going to lead neatly into my journey and why I do what I do. So quite a straightforward talk. I'm very open about my journey. I will take questions if you have a burning desire, but I will try and leave time at the end for questions as well. So back to the beginning. I was not always six foot eight and a half. That was me 50 years ago, the day I was born. I was born into a family which was, by all accounts, extremely fortunate, extremely privileged. It's ironically been, become to be one of the, most, the biggest challenges of my life. That picture shows me at a very young age. It actually shows me with my nanny, not my mum. That's something I want to lodge in your brains right from the very beginning. This extraordinary woman, who was four foot eleven, by the way, there's the yin and the yang of that relationship. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> this heavenly little lady, she taught me to, to, to walk, to swim, to read, to ride a bicycle, to do mathematics. She taught me everything. What was she doing that my mother was not? Everything. 
because that's how it was 50 years ago. And it still is to, in some places today. In those days, it was a badge of honour to see how far you could send your child from you to a boarding school. My parents sent my eldest three brothers to Mabel Hall. We live in Dorset. That's a four, that was a four-hour drive in those days. They considered it a, a privilege. Moving on through the years, I, this picture is designed for one purpose, to show you the sort of regimentation that was inherited to my family. Again, the very privileged family. <laughs> a kind gentleman here who's a little older than me is nodding. You can see the, the sort of the uniforms, the, the sort of regiment. It, yeah, it kind of speaks volumes, doesn't it? The, 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 sort of, the latter version of that is that. That was actually last year. That was my parents' 60th wedding anniversary. We're all still alive, thanks to these two amazing people. Sadly, my father is not with us anymore. He passed last July. Johann Hari, who I'm sure some of you are familiar with, he talks about in that famous book, the opposite of addiction, not being surprising, but being human connection. Several people already today, Miles Adcox being one of them, have talked about this amazing thing called connection. It was the first thing with the panel, all about connection. But I say to you, connection to whom and when? If we don't connect with our parents, if we are unwittingly handed away from birth. I know I didn't breastfeed, I, I'm informed. I was handed over very, very young. So I did not, sadly, connect to my mother and father, just how it was. But for years, I was given everything. I was given the best. I was sent to the best schools. I was given the best clothes. I was given the best uniforms. I was taught how to speak English, supposedly properly. <laughs> Some people might disagree, that's fine. I had nothing to want for on the face of it. People looked into our family, literally over the proverbial wall, and thought, lucky, lucky them, they got everything. Well, materially they weren't wrong. Something that changed my life, which would change it forever. I got, aged eight, given away. At least that's how I've come to view it. I got sent to a good old-fashioned British boarding school. That, to me, looks more like a prison. <clears throat> It was in Winchester. It's now a business school. I have visited it in the last two years. That was an emotional day. But back in 19, in, in, you know, 50 years ago, this was supposedly one of the best boarding schools in the country. These are some scenes I actually managed to find online by Googling the school. It was amazing. And imagine how haunting it was when I saw that fellow again. That was my, <laughs> that was my headmaster. This guy was a relic when I arrived. So... What happened at that school? Well, it's kind of worth talking about for a second. This is one of those classic schools where there was no control. The control was dished out by the prefects. And if you were unwittingly and unfortunately way above average at all for your height, for your, for your age, like I was, you got targeted. And if you hated sports but loved to be sensitive and creative, you got targeted even more. I couldn't work it out at first. It's funny, talking things through in the last few years with some close friends, I've started to put it together. I was very feminine, always have been. But you look at me and see this six foot eight giant. <laughs> but that's not how I felt. Someone asked, uh, Miles Adcox in the last presentation asked about sensitivity. He said, who in the audience believes they're sensitive? I thought, man, most of the room put their hand up. I think most of you are probably highly sensitive or you couldn't do what you do. If you're the sensitive tall giant, you get picked on. At this school, things like being stripped naked and thrown into stingy nettles, um, being held down over a bed and religiously beaten or molested, um, being stood up on two stools, with one stool upside down and the other one, and then tennis balls hit at the stools until you tumbled from about this height and you hit the ground. That's just some of the stuff that was dished out. I've recently been helping a client who went to another boarding school, who can, which can remain nameless. He described in activity which literally is what the CIA do at Guantanamo Bay. He was waterboarded. He's the same age as me. Another boarding school. So what a great school system we've got in England, huh? Well, it left, it left lasting damage. What was specifically done to me is kind of a semantic today. It wasn't fun, but it taught me one thing. To be very, very, very afraid of the world. I want to pause, because this next slide, I want to make one thing very, very clear. When I'm with a client, sometimes, and I'm talking about this stuff, 
and I can see they're getting agitated because I'm starting to even venture into that hallowed territory of their beautiful, perfect family life. And I stop and I say, do you think your parents did a good job? And sometimes they say yes, sometimes they no. But I say, did they likely do their best? And I believe they did. I believe mine did the best. So this is not a blame game. Discernment and blame are a very, very different thing. One is critical to discern what was really going on. To spend your life blaming other people, not going to help. I tried it for a long time. Didn't work. I'll come back to that. When I was at my primary treatment centre in 2004, I was ranting around the, 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 the grounds one afternoon. I'd been in treatment about 10 days. And there's a wonderful therapist. His name, first name was Adrian. I forget his second name, or I happily name him because he's a beautiful man. He said, Mark, what's wrong? Come in and sit down in my office. I said, sure. And he said, come and sit down. Tell me what's going on. So for about 10 minutes, I spat venom about my father all over his desk. Got it off my chest. And he said, OK. Well, that's great. I'm, I hope that helped a bit. I'm going I'm to suggest something for you. And then I would invite you to go into the garden and think about this. Can you do that? I said, yeah, sure. So he said, he looked me square in the eye and he said, a man cannot give you what he does not have to give you. That comment started my recovery. Because up until that time, I'd been punching a hole in the door. I'd been screaming at other inmates. I'd almost been asked to leave the treatment centre because I was so angry. That started to change my life. When I started to understand that actually he did do his best. He just didn't know how to do any differently. Critical difference. I moved on from that school to a good old British public school. Things started to change. So at prep school, I was ritualistically tortured. And I use those words intentfully. That's what it was. Today, those people would be sent to prison. They're probably dead. I don't wish them so. I feel sorry for them today. It wasn't always the case. I spent a few years pretty angry. But what then happened, when I got to my public school, I changed. I started to realise that the only way I could stop the torment was to become the tormentor. So I became a bully. It's, um, it's a very painful part of my life because I don't like to stand here and tell you that I actually became what I loathed. To, on this day, I, I, I recoil viciously against bullies. It, it's one of those few things that'll trip me to anger quicker than anything else to still to stay because, of course, it brings up my old stuff. So why do we do the things we do? This is what I've been asking myself for, most of, for the large part of the re re last third of my life. Well, I now know that it's because of this funny thing called adaptive strategies. Things I learned to do to protect myself. And I learned them good. And the best thing I learned was anger and defiance. Now, something really weird happened in January. This year, I was sitting at my computer, minding my own business, getting on with life, and an email pops up. And it was from a completely random stranger, or so I thought. As I started to read the email, I literally went cold inside. And I'm going to share with you an excerpt from that email, and I'm going to read it to you. You won't remember me at all, but I remembered you the other day from my time at Branfield after a conversation concerning another Drax on Facebook. I recall you as being furiously angry with the world, and if I'm honest, Mark, perfectly happy to pass that anger around. Well, after reading your profile, I now know why. That was one of the most useful puzzle pieces that has ever landed on my, in my intro. I thought, God almighty, was I that unpleasant at Bradfield? So I called him up, and we had the most amazingly heartwarming conversation. He didn't have an axe to grind at me. He just thought he would let me know, because he need, obviously needed to after 20, 35 years, that having spotted me doing this work, he actually wanted to say, I'm glad you're doing The rest of the email was utterly touching. It was deeply kind. So I'm happy you seem to have found your calling. But that was a shock. And it showed me I had never even really thought how angry I was at that school. But this, you can't avoid that, can you? So I took all of that anger. Why did I do that? Why was I so angry? Well, there are many reasons. 
Society has a part to do with it. My upbringing has a huge part to do with it. The regimentation, the discipline, the, the, the totally conditional love. My father, bless him, was an ex-naval officer. He ran our family like a ship. You did as you said, when you said it, or you really knew where you stood. I have stumbled in, stumbled in my training, I've stumbled across the most incredible video. Some of you may have seen this before. I invite all of you to watch this. I'm going to play you the three-minute trailer, which you can find on YouTube. Because this tells you, this, it, is, it is very male-centric, and it is American. But you can morph it across the Atlantic or to any first world country. So just have a quick look at this. Stop crying. Stop with the tears. Don't cry. Pick yourself up. Stop with the emotion. Don't be a pussy. Don't let nobody disrespect you. Be cool and be kind of a dick. Always keep your mind. Nobody likes a tattle. The heroes come before the heroes. Don't let you women run your life. You bitch. It's not coming soon. It's already here. By the way, been out for a while. So. Thinking about that violence, thinking about that anger, what did I do to try and deal with life? What I did was I became a sex addict. I took all that rage that was, I was absorbing inside me, that was being thrown in me, that I was sponging up like a giant car sponge. I took it inside me. And I had to learn how to, how to make myself feel better because I absolutely had no clue how, who to turn to. I was terrified of my father. I knew I couldn't tattletale, I couldn't dob people in, I just got beaten to hell for doing that. And aged 11, one at night, I won't describe in detail, but I do recall very clearly the night I first ever masturbated and it made me feel safe and good and it gave me power. And I was alone on a bed in that school. That was where I linked sexual activity to pain. Now I could have stumbled into my father's liquor cabinet or an empty, a half full of glass of whiskey on the table, or whatever. And I could have grabbed anything and had it and taken it, and it would have made me feel better. Unfortunately, I stumbled into sex. So that's what I did. I became a sex addict. And then with all that anger, guess what I did with it? Well, I did a really great thing. I joined the army. What a great place to get angry, huh? Well, it's probably no small coincidence, and almost certainly higher power, that after two weeks of basic training, I failed. My left knee gave out after an old skiing injury came back to haunt me. And from two weeks of brigade squad, I was out. And I'd spent my entire time at school getting angry, doing crazy stuff, almost being expelled. So I thought, well, the only place an idiot like me can go and actually do this legally is with a gun in my hand. Let's go kill people. Well, I'm probably very lucky that never happened. So then, for the following few years, I spent time, I had a little operation, I'd went, I tried a bit of ski guiding. I tried some recruitment consultancy. That was all, that was sort of, I was so lost. I had no direction whatsoever. Until I finally got on the plane, headed off to Australia. Even that wasn't for the right reasons, but I got there. I did, took a, I did a 1991 with teaching scuba diving. And then finally, after filling too many scuba tanks for my impatience, I thought, you know what, I can do better than this. So I applied to university and I managed to talk my way in with two E grade A levels because my school results were a disaster because I determined very young, I wasn't going to do what my father said. No, F you. You want me to work hard? Well, tough, because I don't feel like it. Not after what I've been through. He didn't know this. He just assumed I was a broken kid. And for all my 10 years of my schooling, he would sit there in that wonderful school report at the end of every holiday, look over his horn brim glasses and say, oh, why are you such a waste of my money? When are you going to start pulling away? You're so bloody lazy. And of course, if, if your father tells you that for 10 years, guess what? You start to believe it. And you start to feel inside well, maybe I am a complete F-up. I'm worthless. Well, I did. So I tried, and I tried a bit of this, and I, I, joined, I came back from Australia. I thought, let's go and do something really glamorous, because I haven't been seen and heard much, and I'm, I'm using vernacular that I only understand today. So let's go and work with billionaires. Let's go and work on floating palaces. Let's go and work in the high ploy of Monaco. And I tried that for a while. Got bored of that. And finally, in 1996, I went back to my roots and I thought, let's just try and do something which I love, which is always using my hands. So I set up a business which morphed over 16 years into a company turning what I used to um, describe as turning dumb homes into smart homes, putting uh, intelligent lighting systems in, home cinemas, all that kind of thing. It took off. It was a good time. 
the audio video industry was suddenly sort of becoming affordable and people wanted music in every room. It was great fun. But something changed on the 14th of June, 2004. I'd been in a relationship with an amazing lady and I had basically been lying to her for a year and a half since we met in November 2002. And she finally had enough. She confronted me after one fated weekend. And on, the, on that proverbial Monday morning, Monday the 14th of June, she had the courage to finally say to me, what did you do this weekend? And I dodged a bullet a couple of times. And she finally looked me in the eye and said, did you have sex with anybody else this weekend at the party you'd just been to? I said, yes, I did. And finally, my world fell apart. And she left this very... <laughs> <laughs> this was easier practicing it with you last night, darling. <laughs> she left this very envelope on my desk. I'll try and read it. Darling, if you could read this. And when you're ready, let me know what you think. Love, A. That changed my life. Why did it change my life so profoundly? It changed my life because finally someone presented me with an ultimatum without a stick in their hand, without a two-foot clothes brush in their hand, without holding me to a, dead, to a bed and beating me, or worse. And who was this woman just screaming out, you have a problem, you need help. And this envelope, by the way, contains a ream of information about SAA, Sex Addicts Anonymous. So that began my journey of recovery. That's the day that changed my life. That's the day my recovery started. And ever since that day, for the last 15 years, I've been trying to rebuild myself. That led me to a treatment centre. I entered that treatment centre on the 8th of July that year. The night before, I tried to kill myself. Because I got, uh, and three weeks from her confronting me, I went from here to here, this place of self-imposed importance, thinking I had a right to behave as I did. And all my father's, it's ironic, isn't it? My father tried to teach me how to be a perfect gentleman. And I did the exact opposite. I don't think that's a coincidence. So I fell into this place, and they started to help me un, 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 unwind and figure out the fact that, yes, I did have a problem. It's called sex addiction. And this is, what we can start, this is what, how you can start to address it. So I did. I left. I went out back to my business. But here's a question, which some of you might even be asking yourself. Was I sober? I got out of what I was doing. I got out of the crazy sexual activities I'd been exploring for all the wrong reasons. But was I sober? Well, that picture gives you a clue. I hadn't addressed my anger. I had been told, yes, you're a sectarian, you've got a problem, you need to stop what you're doing. But I hadn't got to the root of my problem. The school was the obvious target, as I had on the slide earlier. Yeah, the beatings, the brutality from masters and boys, the craziness. Yeah, seemed like a log logical target. But was it? Hold that thought. I say to you, I can now say to you, I don't think I was sober. Because unfortunately, I was burying myself in my work, which some people might say was a great thing, because it led to a bigger company. I had 14 staff. We were doing amazing contracts. We had a multi-million pound business. On the outside, it looked great. But underneath, I was struggling. And then something really hit and hurt, and that was a financial crash. And as I was dealing with luxury goods, that didn't help, because suddenly the cash from the city dried up, and all of a sudden, people weren't so keen to spend £30,000 on a pair of speakers. Stress grew for four years, until finally, in January 2012, I turned to my therapist, and I said, you know what, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I was getting angry again. I'd, I'd had a relatively stable period in early recovery. I hadn't been doing crazy sexual stuff anymore. But I had not been being to myself, faithful to myself or to my girlfriend from, from, from the perspective I was spending hours in the office, coming home crazy hours, because I thought it was so important to earn this money, to be seen to be brilliant, to be seen to be building my company, to be seen to be doing what I knew my father would be proud of me for, because he would judge me based on how successful, how big the company was, what was my turnover, what, what was my biggest contract. Great, great fun having conversations about that over dinner, but was I healthy underneath? No, I don't think I was. So finally, in 2013, I walked out. I walked out of my business. I literally handed it to myself and said, good luck, guys, and left it. 
And I started what I do today. Started a retraining. Went straight right back to, to the drawing board. But why? What was my key driver? What, why did I suddenly think, mental health? That's a good one. Let's try that. Well, I'd been exploring it, you could say, since 2004 in recovery. So I decided to, I, I started to see how I thought I could help other people. Because I, I, it suddenly hit me. There's something not happening in in my opinion, by the way, there's something not happening in this industry. There's, a, there's tens of thousands of therapists. There are some amazing treatment centers. And I went into one, and I had got some amazing help. And it did change my life. But when I came out, what happened to me for the 167 hours in the week when I wasn't with my therapist, nice and cushy and safe and being you know, helped and guided by that amazing therapist? Well, that's a very good question. What was happening? If you're a sex addict today, it's a little easier to get help. It's not quite such a stigma. But 15 years ago, do you think I wanted to tell people I was a sex addict? If you, even today, to some degree, if you're at a, drink, a dinner party and, and someone offers you a drink, and you say, no, actually, I don't drink alcohol, they're likely to go, well, congratulations, you're on the wagon, and you'll get a pat on the back. But if you say, um, no, I don't want to come to that nightclub because I'm a sex addict, they're going to go, whoa. <laughs> What are you, a pervert, a paedophile or something? That's what goes through people's minds. Still to this day, there's a stigma the size of the proverbial elephant in the room. I've sat through three lectures today already. Even, in, even with some incredibly renowned professionals at the front of the room this morning, one of them mentioned sex addiction. But they all readily mentioned the cocaine, the, al the, the gambling, the exercise, and everything else. One gingerly bent in sex addiction. I'm going to stand here and say, I think it's probably the biggest addiction there is. But no one wants to talk about it. How do you deal with that then? So I started, I wanted to, and I knew, my, I knew my place. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm very rare, as my addiction, as my treatment centre was delighted to, and fascinated to tell me. They were determined to pin addictions on me. I was actually given tests to see if I was an alcoholic or a drug addict, or a running, and they, they all came up negative. I'm only a sex addict. Thank God. So I took this, and I thought, what can I do? How can I help? What I can do is I can get honest, I can get real, and I can start helping other men who have been down a similar path. So I thought, let's aftercare. That's where I feel most comfortable. I, didn't, I wasn't particularly interested in going and taking six more degrees to become... I've got a very close friend in this room who's done more degrees and I've got hot dinners, and he's doing extremely well as a highly trained psychotherapist, but I was a little shy of that path. So I thought, I want to get out there. And because I have inherited wealth, which I used to be very ashamed of, but today I'm less so, because I've put it to good use at last. Unfortunately, for many years, I used it to fly to Los Angeles and go to a sex party or do insane shit. Today, I used that inherited wealth to pay for air tickets to conferences. <laughs> Luckily, I've only had to drive to this one, but I've flown to dozens in America. I have got off on my ass and I've gone to treatment centres and I've volunteered my time. It's amazing. When you offer your help for free, it's amazing how doors open. <laughs> Especially in America. So I've gone over there and, I, and I've got experience at the coalface. And of course I have specifically selected treatment centres which specialise in sex addiction. And what I now try to do for myself and others is I start to try and address some of these questions. Because aftercare is a huge thing. I mean, the, the addiction industry is massive, but the aftercare side of it, it means so many different things to different people. These are just some of the questions that I try and address for myself and my clients every day. This next slide is not my own work, but I put it out for a reason. There's a lot of talk about where does therapy end and coaching begin. It's a kind of, some people get very antsy about this. I just, I googled this and I researched it and I found this and I thought it might just be interesting to show it to you because this is what someone has decided, this is where the line lies in terms of where therapy kind of, what therapy kind of covers and then what coaching, where coaching takes off. Okay, well that's fine, so just hold that. I did some more research and I thought, well, let's, let's see what some of the typical differences are. What, what, is the, what, are the, what does Google, the mighty Google, think a coach does versus, I mean, come on, that is the Bible, right? So I plugged it in. Do you know, there's only two things I need you to pay attention to on there. And this is my opinion, and you're absolutely welcome to differ and to, and to, to, to disagree with me. But I do think, if you want to generalise, that therapists tend to focus on the why, and coaches can pick up and focus on the what. I'll come back, I'm going to explain this further. 
But that's what I want to draw your attention. That's why they're in bold and red for now. Okay. All right. And just to bring this, just to tie up this little perspective here, psychology today, I'm going to read this to you. This is the difference between coaching and therapy, who this fellow thinks is overstated. What matters is that people get help in their efforts to grow, master their problems, and become more effective in their lives. Both approaches aim to do this. Who cares, licensing boards notwithstanding, what you call them? I mean, I just put that up there because, you know, you may have, you may have a strong opinion one way or the other, or you may be sitting there thinking, well, actually, we do a bit of both. I'm one, I do the other, I'm the, et cetera. So that's just kind of to intentionally stir your thoughts a bit, all right? Stir the pot. But this, is, this to me is more important. What happens when therapy and or coaching misses the why or the what? Okay, so here's a little story for you. I have the privilege of working at a treatment centre in, uh, in New Jersey, in America. And every three months I go over there, thanks to the clinical director I met at this very conference uh, about four years ago. And he invited me to come over and start presenting a workshop. I started as a two-day workshop. It's now a three-day workshop. And I, they give me six guys every three months, roughly. And I arrive, and I settle down with them, and I take them through a process. Which, funny enough, for the first afternoon starts with that very film I mentioned. The, the, the mask you live in. And we dissect that. And we do lots of fun things. I play videos and music and we do experiential exercises. But the whole purpose of this is to give six broken men a chance to talk about what this treatment centre clearly either doesn't want to address, doesn't, doesn't know how to. But guess what? It's called sex. They, they are a hardcore drug and alcohol clinic. Been running for 60 years and they do an amazing job. But even now, 60 years in, none of them want to talk about what I'm for weird, some weird reason, very happy to talk about. So I rock up, and I had a fascinating fellow. This was June two years ago. And bearing in mind, these guys have been, they, they don't give them to me until they've been into treatment for a minimum of six months, because they think that my workshop is very sweetly the kind of thing that they should approach when they've already had a bit of time in treatment. And I had this guy in front of me. It's called him Bob. We're all called Bob in America. And Bob starts, he comes to me in a private session, as well as a group. And he says, I'd like to talk to you, if I could. I... I've been a bit nervous to share something during my time here because it, it kind of spooks me and I don't know how to deal with it. I said, fine. So my goal is to create that safe space. And I do that by sharing enough of my story when appropriate to help them understand I've been there, I've literally done it, and sadly got the postcard. And so I know, what I know what's going on for these men. And he started to describe a story where he, aged eight, with his sister, aged nine, were walking along the banks of a river somewhere in America, can obviously remain nameless, and they were attacked by two thugs. And the, this, my young client, aged eight, was held to the ground and forced to watch one of the other thug rape his nine-year-old sister. They then run home to mummy and daddy, covered in blood, luckily to be alive, I guess. These people, I believe, have never been brought to justice. And they get home to mummy and daddy, and daddy takes one look at this little fellow and says, well, what, what happened to you? And the boy explains, and straight out of the father's mouth is, well, what the bloody hell do you think you were doing? Clearly, language might have been different. He says, you couldn't protect your sister? For Christ's sake, you, sh you worthless little shit, or words to those effect. This is what was described to me in painful detail with this guy in a very unstable predicament, as you can imagine. So I, I thought, wow, he's been in treatment for six months, and no one knows about this. That's, that's, that's a miss. That's a missing the why. That's a pretty big why. Because that's been driving every aspect of his behaviour for the last 40 years. And I said to him, let's explore this for a second. Do you think that an eight-year-old on any planet, even Krypton, is physically capable of holding off two latter teenage thugs? Well, the simple answer is no. So do you actually now, aged 48, believe you can't protect women? that you're worthless, that you're useless. So I just started to re-spin it. Now, is that therapy? Yeah, you could call it therapy. But I didn't linger there. I started to help him reconstruct a reality which he had not been living with. That had been missed in therapy. I have no doubt everyone in this room who helps clients on this level wouldn't have missed that. But the treatment centre did, and I guarantee they're not alone, because the failure rates for most treatment centres, unfortunately, justify my what I'm suggesting. Here's another one. The what. This is a recent, this is very recent history for me with the father of one of my clients. When I spoke to the father, he rung me, worried about his son, which is very kind. That was the first thing out of his mouth when he came on the phone to me. 
I don't know how to take it from here because it's our son's issues, not ours. I didn't go, really? <laughs> I wanted to. But I did at least have the ability, the training and the presence to go, well, hang on, what's going on here? Because this is a family affair. You don't have one broken person in a family. I know you all know that. But it's worth stating. So I had to deal with that what. And I have since actually had a family meeting because the my client asked me to facilitate it. And we had an amazing four hours together just recently at their home where I was able to, to take the parents through a bit of a miniature three-day workshop and guide them to help, to, to help them understand more of the proceeds of addiction and to give this amazingly courageous son a chance to read the most heart-rending letter to his parents, which he'd sent to me earlier that day and left me in floods of tears because it was what had been done to him was so shocking. I'm going to lighten the load for one minute and 40 seconds. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and... You know, the, it's taken me a few years to figure this out, but the only thing in my way is me. The only thing in her way was herself. Bless her. And now I move to more of the part of this presentation which is specifically about coaching. I've had coaching, I've had to be coached to be trained, which has been fascinating. Because as I've been coached, I've started to go, wow, wouldn't that have been amazing to have had that in early recovery? To have been guided by someone who's knowledgeable and actually I can trust and who's been through this shit. And, yeah, I can, I can ring at a moment's notice and ha have this connection with. How exciting would that be? Here's a fascinating quote which ties right into one of the biggest problems and has already been talked about upstairs and in other rooms today. I learned that recovery coaching is strength-based. Strength it is a wellness model rather than the illness model I've been so used to working with. I'm sure some of you can relate to the fact that since 1935, when Bill Wilson um, formed AA, addicts have been seen as ill, broken, bad. Throw them away in America, put them in prison. And some, obviously, to a large degree here too. I love the fact that what I do is I'm so focused on helping a client move forward. I don't see them as bad. I don't see them as broken. I don't see them as perverted or anything. I just see them as a human being who is doing something because he's in pain. And that leads to this slide. This is my belief. Who's familiar with Gabor Mate? Fantastic. He's an American incredibly... Sorry, thank you. No, no, thank you. God, it's the accent you see. I've lost on the accent. Thank you very much. A Canadian doctor who works in Vancouver. And he's, got, he's been incredibly generous. He's dumped reams of information on YouTube. You can pile through it. It's fascinating stuff. But this is very much something straight out, of, straight out of his playbook. If we are doing something, if we are unhappy, and we go out of our way to make ourselves feel better with something outside of ourselves, we're using something to feel good. So therefore, in my simple brain, that I, I say to myself, well, therefore, addiction must by default be a symptom of a problem. The industry, not, I'm not trying to be rude, but for many years has concentrated on, on the symptom. They haven't gone deeper and asked, asked themselves and helped their clients to ask themselves, why are you doing this? Hence, back to my earlier slide, the why and the what. So, recovery. We move on to recovery. What does, what does the word recovery mean? What does it, can you, someone give me a definition of recovery? What is to make it? something better. Sorry? To make something better. To make something better. Perfect. Thank you. Anything, any, anybody else? What does a recovery mean a to you? A return to a positive state. Thank you, sir. A return to a positive state. Perfect. Quality well, of life. Quality of, yep. Thank you. I looked up the word in the dictionary just to get a quick handle on it. These are some classic dictionary definitions of the word recovery. But let's go a bit further. What are we trying to recover? Ourselves. 
thank you. Beautiful. Absolutely right. That's my, I share your opinion. What do I really want from the one person I've been ignoring for so long? My self. I happen to believe, and again, some of this is my belief. I like to state it when it's my belief, not necessarily fact or, or Google. I happen to believe that every single child ever born on planet Earth since we crawled out of swamps as amoeba has been born vulnerable, fragile, and deserving of love. Now, if you follow that belief and theory to its logical conclusion, it means Hitler, Genghis Khan, um, Stalin, Trump. Sorry, man, that's not fair. Um, they've all been born vulnerable, fragile, deserving of love. If you follow the history of people like that, you will find a fascinating path that led to them becoming, sadly, in Hitler's case, the monster that people are going to love to loathe for the rest of time. Kind of a tough, tough chalice to carry. So that's my belief. To try and help people get in touch with that initial self, that beautiful, innocent spark that we all came out of the womb possessing, that stunning cure. You look at children. All they want to do is touch and play and be curious and, and, and connect. You don't, children aren't racist. They have to be taught to be racist, for example. So they end up in your, on your couches, as I'm sure most of you in here are therapists. How many therapists are in the room? Okay, how many coaches, people who dead call themselves a coach? Fantastic, wow, welcome, thank you. Uh, that's, that's more than I expected. But people end up on the proverbial therapist couch decades later, trying to, trying to figure out why they've, become, why they've become so shut down, why they've lost that light. It's like turning a dimmer on a light. You're born with this beautiful, big, bright light. And over 5, 10, 15, 20, 60 years, the light gets dimmed. And then something happens. And then you end up in front of a therapist or in a treatment centre. And my belief is what, I'm trying, what I try and do post-treatment, because my clients typically have already been in treatment, most of them, and have got to a place where they want to get help, they want to get better. And so that's why then, that's why maybe with the recommendation of another client or a therapist, they end up with me and I start to help them try and live again. That's what I'm doing as a coach. I'm trying to help them find themselves in reality every day. How many different types of coach are there? Well, Christ. Again, Google. Thank you, Google. That's just, and that's not an exhaustive list, but can one person be all things? I don't think so. I'm sure there are coaches out there that do all kinds of amazing things in business and teach people how to grow themselves from a salary of 150000 to 300000 I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in trying to help someone stop themselves killing themselves and get back to a position of peace, some happiness, some joy, and then help them rebuild. So I don't think one person can do all those things. That's just my opinion. Training. I think training is fairly important. And I'm being sarcastic. I think it's incredibly important. These are some of the places I've either been to or interned at, etc. One I have to give a special shout out for, we have a table in there, is SASH. Obviously, this is my heart. This is where my heart lies. So clearly, I'm going to align with an organization which specializes in sex addiction. This is an American organization. Um, and they've been going for many years now. And this is, I'm on the board, and this is something I'm very passionate about. It gives me a reach out to the community where I can stand up. They have a conference every year. This year, it's in Virginia, in Virginia Beach in, in October. I love this quote. This quote, to me, talks to the why and the what. The struggle against the false eye, against one's chief feature or chief fault, is the most important part of the work. And, in, and it must proceed in deeds, not in words. Mr. Gajif. Well, a little bit of fun. I share with you a painful learning experience. That's a transcript. When I did one of my coaching courses with an institution in America called the Deep Coaching Institute in California, we had to get two clients, work with them quite extensively, and some way down the line, I had to record and transcribe a 45-minute session and then submit it to make sure that they thought I was doing a good job. Clearly, I blocked out the words with gobbledygook because this is actual, an actual conversation. This is the transcript that came back when I sent it off to this 
company called Transcribe Me, fantastic little app. And they're sending you back a, a, a Word document. It was 15 pages long. And as I was looking at this, I was going, really? I don't talk that much. But if you look at this, this is me. Mm, 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 yeah, mm, mm, sure. Really? What did this tell me? This is me doing my work and having, getting a painful wake-up call. I couldn't shut up. I had to inject something whilst he was talking. And when I saw it written out, I was going, God almighty. And this is one page. There were 14 pages like this. <laughs> so I had, I had to go, wow, I, what's so hard about silence? Why is it so hard for me to sit in silence? Well, I've never been very good at sitting in silence because I learned that if I threw my energy out into the world and was more aggressive than you or someone at a traffic light or road rage, whatever it was that plagued me for decades, I could keep myself safe. But what about just sitting in silence? How am I going to make somebody else feel safe if I keep interrupting them? So that's, I share that merely to show you that it does, you have to keep doing your own work. And if we can't swallow our pride and every now and then get a bit of a rain check as to whether you're actually doing a good job, I don't think you're going to progress. That's how I feel. So, what makes a great coach? What makes a great coach? What makes a great therapist? Listen. Sorry? Listening. Beautiful. And? Empathy. 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 Fantastic. Open mind. Open mind. You've pretty much nailed the slide for me. Without judging. That's at, uh, sort of ground level 101. I believe a great therapist or a great coach has to start by being an amazing listener and to see their client. But let's not take this to face value. What does that mean? What does it mean to see a client? What does it mean to hear them? To be present for them. How do you do that? Can I invite you to share that? Well, you see and hear them. Absolutely. You can actually see and hear what they're saying. Beautiful. You haven't got, your internal dialogue is not so loud that you can't hear them. Your internal dialogue is not so loud that you can't hear them. You're not putting your stuff onto them. Thank you. If Beautiful. Possible. Sorry? If possible. We've all done it, as that previous slide showed you. So when I meet with clients, probably the first thing I try to establish is the fact that I want to be their accountability partner. This is just to sort of give you something tangible to work with, to, see, to, to emphasize how I work. This is what I want. I, don't want. I want to become the person they call. Now, I know that the therapeutic community have some very strong ethics and boundaries and borders about what you can and can't do. When you, I mean, I, you hear stories of if a therapist sees a client in the supermarket, they, want, they, they need to walk down a different aisle so you can't say hello. Well, that's fine. Sorry? Good. Thank you. I appreciate that. I don't agree with it, by the way. I'm just saying you hear stories, but thank you. I totally accept that. So what I want to do is I want to be the accountability partner. When someone, because I, I remember what I didn't have when I left treatment. I was absolutely terrified. I... This bloody thing called sex addiction, and therefore somewhat feeling, and this is what I was left with immediately post-treatment, feeling dirty, bad, rotten. Unfortunately, that, is where I, that was what I was left with, and this may be my stuff, by the way, I'm not blaming the treatment centre. But that was 15 years ago. Today, I want to be the person that my client reaches out to. So I am there, and how, how I structure the work with my client, I give them my mobile phone number and I say, my phone goes on to do not disturb at 11 o'clock at night, comes off, comes off at, 11 at 7 a.m. But if you want me, you only have to ring twice because I set up my iPhone so that if you ring twice within a few seconds, it goes, oh, this must be important, it lets it through. So I give my clients access to me 24-7. Now, rather like when you buy a camera from Dixon's for £250 and they offer you the insurance for an extra 75 Someone's making billions by people going, yeah, why not? Because how many people actually use that insurance? Hardly anybody. So I give my clients the feeling of safety for no extra money. I charge for the sessions, but I don't charge them to make a phone call. Because if that's the difference between using and not using, I want to be there for them. That's how I work. You may disagree, that's fine, but this is how I work. This is how I work as a coach. And this is what I offer as a coach. Because I want to be this accountability partner. I want to be right there for them. Before the truth sets you free, it's going to be tough. Okay? 
when, I, when, when trying to come to terms with my own truth, I went through a lot of pain for years. And I'm not talking about just in treatment. It was ongoing right through many years of treatment. I did not want to get honest. I, I know I've sat in therapy sessions and I've omitted plenty of things when sharing with my therapist over the years. I don't think I've ever sat there and told her a direct lie, but I've chosen to be very manipulative with the truth when it suited me. And not because I was trying to consciously con her, but I just, that's, I, I hadn't, I, it's taken a year to break that habit. I learnt it with my parents. So is it any wonder I then carried it on in through treatment? No, of course not. So when I do work with clients, honesty to me is one one I have to get honest with them. If I, I have to come from a place of integrity, and I, I do believe I instill that. That's how I work. So I set this paradigm up from the day one. If a client can't get honest with me, we have to have a very serious discussion about that. Simpler tools, everyday kind of things that sort of tick box things, which you may do, you may not do, but this is some of the stuff I do. Electronic security. How difficult is that to manage these days? Everyone has a smartphone. Most average eight-year-olds have a smartphone. That gives eight-year-olds access to unlimited porn if you're not careful. Some of you, I'm sure, are parents. Some of you, I'm sure, have experienced the troubles of your children dealing with smartphones. Well, what about addicts? The internet, was it 25% of internet searches are for sex or something extraordinary? It's a huge problem. And clients have got so used to these bloody smartphones and everything else and their tablets, etc. How, do they, how are they going to find any path through the fact they have to use them, but they have to use them healthily? It's kind of like behavioural addictions. The internet is a kind of behavioural addiction. You have, with the exception of gambling, I don't think there's one behavioural addiction I can think of, correct me if you spot or spot, think I'm wrong, which you don't have to do to some degree. If you're an anorexic, you have to eat three times a day. You have to exercise. You have to work. You have to have sex. Luckily, I say luckily with a tongue in cheek, you don't have to have drugs. You don't have to have alcohol. But the behavioural addictions, they throw up a slightly different challenge. Electronics is just one of those. Home visits. This is something I did a few times in California when I was interning over there. Uh, my boss would say, can you go with this client to their house and just see how they're living? And this isn't, this isn't a photograph of a real house, by the way. This is off the internet. But, you know, clearly, if I go around to a client's house and they're living in the top one, I'm going to say, OK, so do you think this is healthy? I'm going to just guide them lovingly to say, what do we do? And I might even start helping tidy up their house. On this particular occasion in California, I, I didn't, but we had a good chat about it. And I helped, encouraged this person to maybe just change a few things and start living in a pigsty. But it's important, because if you're going home to a pigsty, where's your sense of worth? Where's your sense of value? So, yes, OK, getting from one to the other is going to take a little bit of money and a little bit of patience, a little bit of self-discipline, but it's doable. Exercise, another one. We all know, how, we all know the benefits of exercise. Some, of, some addicts who may not have exercised for years, maybe not ever. They may, not, they may be terrified to go for a walk in the park. The park might be a pickup joint for a sex addict. So go with them. I regularly walk my clients into my local park and we go hang out in the sun, sit on a bench, talk there. It's wonderful. Doesn't, I, don't, I don't want to always tie them to my, to my sofa and sort of you know, make it feel too clinical. I want it to be lively. I want it to be real world. And if, if we're walking through a park and something comes up, okay, let's talk about that. And sometimes it happens. You know, I'm triggered by this person. Okay, let's talk about that. Because you have, you have to live out here. So let's get real. So exercise, very important. Mindfulness, meditation. Everyone knows the benefits of it, but do addicts actually do it? Not so much. You know, you've got to set time aside for this. Comes back to me, comes back to me being an accountability partner. We make plans, and then I try and hold them accountable. Asking for help, a critical tool. It's one of the hardest things to do. If you watch that, the, the video of it I've, I've um, shared with you, Boys don't ask for help. You saw it even in the trailer. Young, young boys, I can't speak for young women. I'm just, because I'm not a woman. But I, I can speak for young boys. We don't ask for help. We were taught not to ask for help. It was seen as weak. So, I did, so, you, so we learned not to do it. But think of the challenge, for example, of going to an STT test. You're fresh into recovery. How terrifying. I've done it. I did it in, 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 um, in treatment. One of the most terrifying 10 days of my life was giving blood 
and waiting for the result. And I broke down in floods of tears when the result was clean. And I, the, the, the nurse said to me, what do you think? And I said, well, I actually deserve to have every disease under the sun because I was still so hating myself. I thought, well, that would just be rather rough justice. This is 15 years ago. But that's where I was. Terrifying. So walk someone to the STD clinic. Support them. This is the kind of thing I would happily do. Asking for help is one thing. Who you get close to is another. Okay? Because addicts have a nasty habit of living in very, very dangerous environments. They, they may be living with someone who's incredibly unhealthy, but they sure as hell, if they're a sex addict, are doing things that are unhealthy. And they may be mixing with people who are unhealthy. You know, the easy one to explain is alcoholics. You know, they may have a whole bunch of old, swilling beer, beer mates, beer-loving mates, who, and they, they've been going to the pub for the past 20 years. Well, is that going to be healthy for an alcoholic fresh in recovery? Probably not. So who you get close to is very important. You know, at the end of the day, everybody goes through this this journey, it's, it's, it's different for everybody. Clearly this is in here because I'm six foot nine and taller than most of you. But we do all go through this stuff differently. And what is important to me is to make sure I'm as, as empathic as possible with my clients and treat every single one as an individual. Because to me, there is no miracle puzzle cure or I'd be a millionaire. If I could, if I could bank, monetize that one, then it'd be happy days. But it doesn't, it doesn't exist. That's the day-to-day -day stuff. That's the simple, tangible stuff. We can all get our head around that. What about the stuff that is a little bit deeper? So this slide I put up, you know, I asked myself, what have I noticed that addicts lack? What have I seen from my own experience? What have I, my own personal experience and my experience working with, with clients? Well, I think the first one is, this has already been talked about today in other lectures, self-esteem. One of the most notable things addicts lack is self-esteem. Okay, these are some of the things that, and you, this list could be a hundred lines long. We all know that, all right? I, when, I, when I got up this morning, I was totally cool and calm and collected. Then I arrive and I find I've got people in the audience who have given me therapy. I think, oh my God. You know, my heart started going and then the thing was wrong and someone was in here when I came to set up and I'm, oh my God. You know, and, and I'm starting to say, oh my God, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. And I'm... And I was sat here at the beginning thinking, God, look at all your amazing faces. You know so much more than me. I still tell myself this shit. But I do believe I'm doing some good in this world. Or I wouldn't be standing here. So I try and help people by sharing part of my story and using various tools to start to break through this crippling self, lack of self-esteem. A lot of addicts struggle with positive, positive and negative thinking. Tie straight into the last slide. You know? We, I've spent years, decades, buried in negative thought. It's not going to get you anywhere. And one particular tool that addresses everything I've just said for the last few minutes, who has ever heard of the Enneagram? Fabulous. Love you, even more. The Enneagram is a tool which I cannot encourage you enough to at least explore. It is a tool which models the concept of there being nine basic personality types or temperaments. That's what they are. They're temperaments. Okay. There's a fantastic big blue book. You can Google it and get it on Amazon called The Wisdom of the Enneagram, written by Don Riso and Russ Hudson. Russ Hudson. This is, what this talks about, it says that everybody that, that comes onto planet Earth will conform to one of these nine types more than the other eight. I'm a four. I, I have rated myself as, as a four, which happens to be, by no small coincidence, known and recognised as the most sensitive, or overly sensitive, as my mother has loved to tell me for many years, um, member of the Enne member of, um, part of the Enneagram. But let me just make a point to make, my, make it really clear. Let's say you have a challenger, the eight, someone who's an eight. And this is, by the way, this is not a ranking. An eight is not better than a one, it's just a number. But let's say you have a challenger, okay, and you have um, a helper, and they're, they're tasked with the same task. Do you think someone who is big, ballsy, brash and blunt is going to get on with someone who is a timid little helper who will do anything to please them? What do you think? He Sorry? He might. He might, yeah, yeah. he might. But is it going to be a healthy relationship? No, probably Thank you. Not. Pro probably not, okay. Equally, if you have two challenges on the same team, how's that going to work out? 
They're going to knock heads all the time. But guess what? People are going to stand around and go, why can't George get on with Bob? God, why can't they just agree? Why can't they just get back in their box and do as they're told kind of thing? And people, this is what, this is what you hear mothers and fathers saying about children. Do you know, I've done everything for these two, but Jeremy worked out so badly and Charles is so perfect. Really? Well, I don't buy that. In fact, I think it's tragic when you hear people comparing one with another. There is a reason we do things. Nothing, I'm going to suggest to you, I'm going to stand here and say nothing you've ever done on this planet is random. I'm going to say there is a reason you have done everything, ever, since the day you were born. And this will help you figure out why you do the things you do. So it's an amazingly powerful tool. You can tell I'm a little bit passionate about it. Um, and by the way, if you want to know more about it, my amazingly beautiful girlfriend at the back there, um, wave, darling. Thank you, darling. She is an Enneagram specialist. She's been teaching this to convicts in San Quentin prison and two others for the last three years. If you can get convicts to fall in love with you because you help them figure out the reason they've done the things they've done, I guarantee it'll help your clients. So what are we, so what are some of the things we're working towards? I love this picture. Okay, I, I try and help by inspiring, and again, as I've said, the, the, the tools I use to empower a client. How do I do that? Knowledge. You can't just stop. Nancy Reagan's slogan, just say no, great. Did it work? No, of course not. Because without getting to the why, which you will do brilliantly, I'm sure, you're never going to just be able to put something down. It's an impossibility. You, might, you can white-knuckle it for a few months, but you will never stop until you understand, until you are empowered to know why you do the things you do. Here's a lovely quote. Never try to compel others to change. Leave them free to change naturally and orderly because they want to. And they will, and they will want to when they find that your change was worth the while. To inspire in others a desire to change for the better is truly noble. Gratitude. God damn it. How many years have I spent not in gratitude? It's sad. I could make jokes about it, but my beloved father, rest, his, rest in peace, wouldn't be too impressed, and my mother sure as hell wouldn't. Teaching someone to be grateful for what they have. I, the only, one of the problems with the Enneagram Type 4 is that we compare ourselves to other people. God, have I done that to in my life? Comparison is the thief of all happiness. Not my quote, but it's a good one. I spent so long looking at someone that has this or is that or does that, and I think, oh, if only, yes, I wish. And I've even played the lottery a few times. Felt that look at that did me. But I have compared myself so often, and by doing so, I'm not in gratitude. I'm not even looking in the mirror going, well, what do I have? Well, for a start, I've got two legs, two arms, they work. I'm incredibly privileged. I was given everything I ever wanted for materially. Why the hell don't I do something useful with it? I wish I'd asked myself that 20 years ago, by the way. Luckily today... I've learned what that means to me. So I try and help my clients. I impress upon my clients this simple theory. Simple but hard to do. Compassion leads on to the, it's just, it all, this is all so tied into what I was sharing with you. If compassion doesn't include yourself, you're, you're, just, you're not going to succeed. You've got to be compassionate to yourself. One of the things that addicts struggle with, again, speaking from personal experience, when you start to look at what you've done and when you have sadly, hurt, abandoned, and abused as many people as I have through my addiction. It, 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 it kind, of, kind of comes with a bit of a pill called shame. And I still, to this day, sometimes struggle. When Suzanne sometimes says something to me, sorry darling, I'm going to have to talk about you just a second. When she says something to me, which if I, she's a very good teacher, and sometimes she launches into this amazing prose and she's teaching me something, but guess what? I'm not always hearing what she's teaching me. I hear someone telling me what to do. I hear a teacher. I hear my teachers, the ones that dragged me around the classroom by my hair and threw me through doors. I hear my father saying I'm a worthless waste of his money. Because that's the, that's, that's the paradigm set up by this supposedly perfect privileged upbringing. So I've had to learn to have compassion for myself. I've had to break through the shame. I have to have compassion for myself when I start to get reactive and when I start to get antsy. And when Suzanne is strong enough to turn to me and say, darling, you know what? That's, 
I want you to ask yourself how you think that what you just said landed with me. That's a tough one to answer. She does it very well and with a lot of love. And through building our relationship together, I have started to be able to say, you know what? Let me think about that. Let me get curious. There's a lovely C word for you. Curiosity. If we can get curious about our part in something, we won't automatically assume, which makes an ass out of you and me, we all know that one, that it's actually the fault of our, of our partner, of our business associate, of our boss, of our children, whatever. Assuming is a dangerous game. To help with all those theories, this is a tool I use in my work. Clearly, as a coach, I need to be setting some challenges to my clients. I might email them a link to read or to write. I might even sit in a session with them. A lot of my sessions are two hours. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I, I would far rather see less people than today and have more time with someone. So we're going to really get into something, get into something meaty, go for a walk in the park, figure out how we're going to do something, come back, and then, then, they, then they leave with a bit of a spring in their step and with a goal. So some of the goals I'd set are based around videos and movies and pictures. I'm going to play you something, and then I'm going to ask you why you think I've played it. Let me handle something. What do you want? Shit. Wow, give it. Sam, just, just give it to him. OK. So why do I play that trailer? Why do I play that little clip from that film? Fascinating. Ignore that. Didn't know it did that. Why did I, what's going on there? Why do you think I might use that video? It could be too late. It could be too late for what? Not for a change. For a change. <laughs> That's amazing. That's fantastic. It could be too late for change. So. I have a tool which I use for myself. It's called a ghost moment, straight out of this film. I use that clip. If I have a client who is finding it extremely hard to break out of typical behaviours, what was typical about Patrick Swayze's, Patrick Swayze's behaviour? What's typical about it? Running in to protect the woman. Running in to protect the woman. And being the hero. Being the hero, thank you. Being what society would expect him to be a man, right? So what could he have done differently? Just give away the money, give him the money. Could listen, to, listen to her, and giving the money away. Absolutely, thank you. So what am I pointing to here? I'm pointing to the fact that we do have other choices. That's what recovery is about. So what I say to people, the next time you think of rushing into something, I want you to have a ghost moment. So I've played the video, I've given them something tangible, and hopefully the next time something crops up, they go, oh, Ghost moment, whoa, I've got to take a step back and I don't want to see myself dying on the floor. So hang on, whoa, is there something I can do differently? I also use pictures. What is that? Go away. What does that evoke? When you see that image, what does it evoke for you? Anyone ever seen this photograph before? Yeah. And it's from? Oh. Sorry? No. It's Burning very good. It's from Burning Man. Burning it's a huge um, festival they have in the, in the Nevada desert every year. This is actually about 20 feet tall, by the way. Incredible, made out of concrete rebar, sitting in the middle of the desert. As, and there, there are dozens and dozens of these extraordinary sculptures that, that, that descend upon this part of the middle of the desert for a, one week every year. What does it say to people? What do you see? The inner child, there we go. Thank you, sir. Step up and give the lecture. <laughs> Beautiful, it is. To me, this screams in a child. How many people have ever can relate to the adults here? Come on, be honest. Thank you. I mean, how many times have I got into bed with a girlfriend in the last 33 years and done this? I've turned my back because my adult absolutely is not going to be vulnerable enough to admit that I was wrong, that I admit that I was a dick. But my inner child is doing what he's always done. Talk to me. Just reach out. I'm here. See me. So this, is, this to me is one of the most incredibly beautiful sculptures I've ever seen. So I will 
She said, I will use it in my workshop. I will send it to a client. I'll give it to a client. And then we'll discuss it. And I'll say, print it out. Or I'll even give them a printout to take, take this home. Stick it on your wall. What this is all alluding to, underneath everything that I've talked about, is one key thing. Feelings. I spent a very long time, I have spent a very long time in my life, avoiding my feelings. Even through a large part of 15 years in recovery. It's all very well to, I've spent a lot of time sitting, sitting in dinner parties and someone says, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm an addiction recovery coach. And they go, what the hell's that? And I go, well, I, I'm got in, I, I work in the field of addiction. How'd you get into that? Well, I'm, I, I suffered child abuse. Really? Wow. Child, whoa, God, you poor thing. The words child and abuse in a sentence, they elicit attention. And I now know, looking back at times in the last 15 years, I know I have sat in rooms and I have got high by sitting and pouring highly inappropriate stories into people in dinner party situations because it got me seen, it got me heard. I felt validated. I felt that they actually now respect me. Well, why did I need that? Why do I need that in recovery? Well, the answer is I don't if I'm healthy, but I did for many years because I didn't get to the one, th one the critical piece I was missing. It's all very well talking about being whipped or beaten or abused at a, at a public school. But that's not where my addiction started. My addiction started the day I was born because I did not attach to my parents. I did not, I was not taught, I, was not, I did not have role modelled to me by the two people that, bless them, I wish had to how to healthily process feelings and emotions. So I've gone through most of the last 50 years doing everything within my power to bury my feelings, to make sure you think I'm cool, and this perfect six foot eight giant you see standing before you is totally in tune and everything else is perfect for me. But underneath I've been like the proverbial swan going upstream. I've been paddling like a crazy man. So if we don't get in touch with our feelings, if you can't link if you can't help your clients link, if you can't help yourselves join the dots between what happened to you in childhood and why, how that correlates to what you do today, I will stand here and say you cannot help people get well. My belief. I'm getting close to the end, but something very profound happened last year. My father died in July last year, and I had a, went through a really, really tough patch. I did some things I regret. I ended up th realizing I needed to take a rain check. Because if I'm going to continue to help people, I can't be doing crazy shit anymore. I can't be going back to that. I've got to find a healthy way through this. So I went off to um, on site in America. <coughs> some of you may know. I got some more help. And through having met Gabor Mate two years ago in Toronto at a conf another conference I'd gone to, and hearing him talk about this thing called ayahuasca, I thought, ooh. Why don't we try something a little left of centre for a change? My beloved therapist sat with me last October and looked at me and said, so Mark, you've never done drugs in your life. Why would you therefore go 5,000 miles to the Amazon and take drugs? Well, bless her, she's been kind enough to swallow that statement. And when she talked to me when I got back, in that very first chat I had with her, she was humble enough to say at the end of a two-hour session, there is something a little different about you. I said, yes, there is. What it comes down to is whether you believe in hallucinogenic medicine, plant medicine or not, whether you think it's acceptable or not, I can tell you that it has transformed my life. The critical thing was I was ready for it. I'm not saying that flying to the Amazon and sitting with a bunch of shaman and drinking ayahuasca for three weeks is a miracle cure for addiction. I'm not saying that. I'm saying what it did for me was it enabled me to get down and dirty. Just sitting in the jungle was torture. Everything that moves in the jungle bites you hard. And you have to deal with the sweat, the heat, the rain, the ants, the mosquitoes. That alone was a challenge. And then when I drank this weird, green, revolting liquid, and on that very first night, through some catastrophic release of pain, that had me physically writhing like, a, like it looked like I was having an epileptic fit on the mattress I was lying on for about two hours. What was that? 
It was energy. It was stored, bottled, negative energy. The shit I'd been carrying for most of my life. That's what came flooding out. I drank this extraordinary medicine seven times over three weeks. And every time I drank it, more was released. What it did was it showed me, because ayahuasca is known to open memory portals that you can't do without taking it. And I got in touch with the facts. I now know, I can stand here and tell you that my first nanny, not that beloved little pixie I showed you earlier, she, she only took over when I was four. My first nanny beat me. Parents never knew about it. But I actually saw it physically happening under the influence of this, um, of this medicine. So I'm not standing here necessarily trying to convert you all and say, let's get on a plane and go to the Amazon, although I would, I, it did me a world of favours. All I'm saying is I'm bringing it to your attention. I'm sort of sowing a seed saying 12-step recovery started, to get, started my recovery and probably saved my life. It did save my life. Is 12-step on its own enough? I don't think so. It's up to you, to what you believe, what you believe. I don't think it's enough. What doesn't it give you? It doesn't give you an education about what the hell your parents did to you, unless you're very lucky. You get a good sponsor who happens to have been through some stuff and might have had a bit of trauma therapy, and they can start to him, yeah, well, that's the rarity. It's not the rule. So what I implore you to start thinking about is, what, is our, what other options are available to you? Ayahuasca is just one. It's a very powerful one, but it costs me... $5,000 in total to fly there for the whole thing for three weeks. What does $5,000 buy you in a treatment centre? Five days. Or less. So I sow the seed. It's up to you. I will talk. I could lecture all day about the joys of the jungle. But I won't because I haven't got time. But just so you're aware of it, it changed my life. I'm going to summarise. This is one of the most famous people ever born, Viktor Frankl. Holocaust survivor. This ties into everything I've just been saying. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space, there lies our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. In that space are feelings. That's what the space is. Can you, when triggered by something, deal with with the feelings that come up inside you because they are linked to something that happened 50 years ago. And until you figure that out, until you help your clients figure that out, they will keep repeating the same patterns over and over again. They will keep jumping from trigger directly to response with no thought, like Patrick Swayze, that there is another choice. Where does it all lead back to? It leads back to what you did when you came into the room. It helps with presence. In summary, some key points that I would just like to leave you with. Therapy and coaching and their integration are critical, not an option. Whatever you are, whatever you do, there is a space for all of us because there's however many, whatever pitifully few number of treatment centres there are in this country compared to the 63 million people who live here. We are so understaffed. So there's, there's, there's Acres of room. But we have to start talking and sharing and helping one another and getting a client's permission for me to talk to a therapist and say, well, this is what I've discovered. Maybe this is your domain. And the therapist rings you back and goes, well, can you work on this, Mark? We need to collaborate more. The why and the what must be explored. Not one or the other. And, and my personal belief is in that order. It doesn't always work that way. It's not a perfect world. But this is what I believe. And this is, again, based on my own experiences, because I didn't explore enough of the what. And I could have dramatically improved and shortened my, my journey through recovery to health if I had actually done this. A working understanding of treatment centres and the larger therape therapeutic community is critical. What do I do? I mean, very recently, painfully recently, I had a situation where a father called me and told me that his son was with a lady in a hotel in a certain part of London, and he was apparently locked in the bathroom and taking heroin. What the hell do I do with that? I'm not um, a mobster. I'm not trained to walk in and physically strong arm someone out of a heroin needle and etc. So I, what did I do? I reached for help. I called people. I got it working and I facilitated a solution. In other words, and how did I do that? I was only able to do that because I know people. I've got off of my bum. I've visited God knows how many places. I've 
been coming to the likes of this conference now for five years, and I know enough people, I have enough phone numbers in my proverbial phone to be able to help, even if I physically and emotionally am not trained to do it. So know your limitations and know who to turn to for help. And my last summary point is we must continue to do our own work. How can you take clients where you have not been yourself? And I do not mean that you have to have been sodomised age six or whatever to be able to empathise with the client who was sodomised age six. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you have to understand the principle of understanding what might have happened. We've all got patterns. Every one of you in this room is, has, been, has sponged up from the day you were born. Everything went on around you. And you've all developed certain patterns to help keep you safe on this planet. Understanding your own patterns will enable you to understand your clients' patterns. You're only going to get there by continuing to explore yourself. That lovely C word I shared with you, curiosity. Keep getting curious. Keep curious. Keep letting that beautiful inner child inside you reach out and go, I'm curious. I want to know more. What does this do? What does that mean? Keep it going. Keep it alive. At the end of the day, we are all, everybody in this room on some level, I'm going to suggest, is helping to bridge the gap between treatment and life. I'm going to suggest to you that the only people standing in our way is ourselves. I'm going to end, if I may, I'm a sucker for punishment. <laughs> I'm going to end with my father. And I know this is not going to be easy. <laughs> but it's important. <laughs> there he is. He passed last July. And for all the things that didn't happen, plenty did. And he left me an amazing legacy. He loved to use words. He loved to play with poetry. And I'm going to read to you a very short poem, which he sent me at a time when I was particularly down. Whose high endeavours are an inward light that makes the path before him always bright, who, not content that former worth stand fast, looks forward, persevering to the last, from well to better, daily self-surpassed. Thank you, Dad. And thank you.